Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us now look at this doctrine of economic bliss once again as in classical economics in order that may be, we may be able to highlight the contrast which Schumpeter seemed to build into the whole thing through his evolutionary preoccupations. This notion of bliss is inherent in Say's law. Can one of you tell me what Say's law is all about? Very nice, although that is not very original, that is like Keynes, but still, um, yes, according to Say, it is impossible for an economy to have any general overproduction, which means markets will always be in equilibrium. And he argued that markets not clearing is a short run phenomenon. In the short run, you might have a little excess demand or an excess supply in markets, but they tend to adjust themselves over the long run period. The adjustment mechanism through which markets adjust to equilibrium in the long run is through what is known as wages and prices flexibility. Just give you an example, if all the markets are in equilibrium and suddenly there is a stochastic factor say a change in tastes influences the market for garments, then it is possible that market for a particular kind of garments goes out of fashion or rather the taste for a particular kind of garments is no longer fashion, which means demand in that particular market drops. And what happens when demand drops? What happens to prices? market is in equilibrium, demand falls, what happens to prices? If demand falls when the market is in equilibrium, it means there is an excess supply and when there is an excess supply automatically prices will fall. So, this is the mechanism which classical economics is talking about. So, when there is an excess supply like this, prices in the garments market will drop, which means production in the garments industry would diminish or decline and with the declining production resources are released from this particularly there is unemployment in the garment industry. So, when there is unemployment in the garment industry in fact workers are released simultaneously there are other sectors in the economy where people are spending more money now that they are spending less money on garments they are spending that money elsewhere. So, when that happens demand in some other sector goes up, prices in that sector go up and resources and labor gravitate to that sector. So, flexibility of prices ensures that resources are drawn away from one sector to another during imbalance and when that happens labor migrates because there is unemployment in one sector, wages fall. and there is demand for labor in another sector, wages rise and labor migrates. In short, short run fluctuations in the market occur and are stabilized and equilibrized, equilibrated due to wage price flexibility in the economy. So, the adjustment mechanism is crucial, the flexibility of wages and prices and as long as wages and prices are flexible, there is bliss in the economy, there is full employment this is classical economics. There is no scope for evolution here. There is nothing dynamic here. Everything is given, is not it? Now, Schumpeter brings in something here. He says, this Walrasian economy in which there is general equilibrium, in which there is full employment, in which there is bliss is only a stationary state. He says this stationary state is not a permanent state in the economy. 
it is a state in which elements of chain start working. How do they work? He says the entrepreneur in this economy is an agent of change. The entrepreneur is not satisfied with what he has. The entrepreneur is always wanting to do something different and make a little extra profit, a little extra money. In other words, the desire to maximize profits which is at the heart of the bliss in economics is the very thing which pushes the economy into its dynamics according to Schumpeter. The, the entrepreneur who wants to maximize his profit wants to try something new all the time. So, he is an inherent innovator, he is all the time trying to do something new and what are the things that he does? Schumpeter calls this trying out new combinations. The entrepreneur could be introducing a new product into the market. He could be introducing a new process into the market through which the same product is made, which means there is a technological change which minimizes cost. He might try a different organizational form. In other words, he might try to acquire a patent and acquire monopoly rights. And if he does that, then the organization of the industry changes. He might try opening new sources of supply. Which, which was never known before. For example, uh, uh, the best example you can think of is the use of silica in electronics industry to get the chips made. And uh, the use of silica dramatically brought down the price of chips simply because silica is so easy to handle and so easy to acquire. And finally, opening up new markets, doing a lot of campaigning, exploring new markets and opening them. In short, through these five types of activities, what the entrepreneur is trying to do is to continuously try out new combinations of doing business. What Schumpeter is saying is that the Walrasian bliss usually does not assume anything about the entrepreneurial quality of the entrepreneur. The Walrasian bliss is a stationary state in which people are apparently mindless, right? They are following set rules. And that is about it. At the end of that, they all attain some kind of an equilibrium and they stay there. But Schumpeter says in the real life, the economy is not like that. It is not that stationary state because entrepreneurs are all the time pushing, pushing, pushing to do something new, pushing to create something new, pushing to start something absolutely fresh. So, in this fashion, there are entrepreneurs who are rising through their innovative activities, creating new monopolies, creating new markets, creating new dominance and leading the industry. And then they rise, there is a cyclical growth around them of all people who cater to him. And then as this entrepreneur reaches a saturation point, another entrepreneur has started an innovative activity. So, there is another cycle around that one. So, there is an endless up and down cycle which is going on in the economy, which is a very dynamic process. And Schumpeter thinks this is the fundamental aspect of capitalism. And he calls this creative destruction. He calls this creative destruction for the simple reason that the entrepreneurs are endlessly creative and they are constantly breaking down the citadels of certainty and certitude which everybody else in the economy has. The workers think they have got their job set, everything is fine. Here is an entrepreneur who starts something new. He threatens your market, your, you lose jobs, you have got to adapt, relearn and grow again. Some other entrepreneurs are very steady, comfortable there and this new, and this new innovation creates a threat. In other words, this creativity of entrepreneurs in capitalism is a very destructive process. It is destructive in order to achieve creativity. So, it is a creative destruction through which capitalism sees its dynamics. And the heart of business cycles in capitalism is through this activity of entrepreneurs. So, continuous movement up and down in the economy of different sectors and in the process, each entrepreneur who has done an innovation, who has given a new fillip, new leadership to the market pushes the economy a few steps ahead. Then as he slows down, another entrepreneur with another innovation pushes the economy a few steps ahead. In short, economic growth itself is defined through this dynamic process 
which is happening in the economy all the time. Most important economic growth is not a linear process. You see, you remember from your theoretical economics that say for instance, a Harold Domer growth model, you find that the capital stock provides a steady profile of warranted growth rates. The labor availability pro provides you with a steady opportunity of natural growth rate and the actual growth rate kind of vacillates or oscillates between these two growth rates and that is what is happening in growth. Whereas, here it is not the warranted growth rate of capital and technology that is important. It is, but there is a lot more to it. It is not the natural growth rate provided by the constraint on labor that provides another limit. No, in Schumpeterian world there is really no limit. Existing stocks of labor and capital acquire different meanings according to whether you are innovating or not. So, this is the process of again as Schumpeter calls it creative destruction, which is the process of innovation in capitalism. There are innovators, then there are imitators who follow him and the whole economy grows. Then as imitators grow, the novelty of this particular innovation slowly declines. Then there is somebody else who is innovating. This is the cyclical process through which the economy moves and grows. And as you can see, growth is a truly discontinuous process in this. So, Schumpeter's theory of growth is actually a truly evolutionary theory and the first evolutionary paradigm in economics should be attributed to Schumpeter. At the same time, there are fundamental aspects of orthodoxy which even Schumpeter did not question. The orthodoxy in economics for instance assumes centrally that all economic actors are not just hedonistic as we saw in yesterday's discussion of institutionalism, but they are also rational. In other words, <coughs> economic actors are not just self-seeking and pleasure-seeking, they are also rational. They are conscious in their attempts at maximizing their returns out of their resources. Schumpeter does not question this. In fact, if anything he says entrepreneurs are very special cases of economic rationality according to that kind of reasoning. But the rationality postulate comes under very severe questioning in the 1940s and constitutes the basis of what later came to be new Schumpeterianism or new evolutionism in economics. The person who questions the rationality postulate is not himself the founder of new evolutionism, but his writings have such profound meaning that the discipline goes through a major transformation. The person whom you probably know who did this is Herbert Simon. Have you heard of Simon? Well, okay. Now, if you have not heard of Simon, it is fine because most people have not heard of Simon who study orthodox economics. Simon was not an economist at all. He's, in fact, he is the only person who did not qualify as an economist who got a Nobel Prize in economics. Simon was a psychologist who in the 1940s were trying to, was trying to study organizational behavior was basically trying to understand how organizations behaved, how decisions were taken in organizations and how consensus was reached in decision making and how decision making itself was a learning process in organizations. It was a major line of work. He was not talking so much about firms, he was not talking so much, so much about corporates, he was talking about local governments for instance. He was trying to find out how local governments worked how do they behave, how do they take decisions, how do they allocate resources, if they are pricing some products, how do, how do they decide how to price. In short, Simon was concerned with issues which a large number of economists would not even consider a subject of economics. You know, Very few economists were at that time concerned about how the economics of say for instance municipalities worked. 
but this was the preoccupation of Simon, not as an economist, but as, as an organizational psychologist. He was trying to understand the way the organization's mind worked and how decisions happened and how selections happened in among different choice alternatives that these organizations faced. Now, the first thing that Simon found was that organizations do not have a single objective. For example, uh, economic theory tells you that all firms are profit maximizers, does not it? Or worse still, if it is not profit maximizers, there might be a compromise. For instance, Bomol says firms are not profit maximizers, they are total revenue maximizers. Whichever firms have a single objective which they try to maximize and attain. Simon says no, he found organizations were not doing this. Organizations were actually involved in a multiple decision scenario. For example, an organization say a firm would have shareholders, then there would be directors, then there would be executives who are employed by the firm from the CEO downwards to the last worker. And these people, these employees would be organized into different departments of the firm. There would be a purchase department, there would be a department with concerned with administration, there would be a manufacturing department which has its own uh, little subdivisions each with its own uh, preoccupations. There would be a finance department which is trying to look at the financial issues involved in all these things. There would be a marketing department, there would be sales, all kinds of departments into which the employees of the firms are organized. And according to Simon, there is no one particular reason why all the departments should have a single focus towards profit maximization the purchase department would try to purchase things at the least cost. This might not be in conformity with what the manufacturing department want, might want, because the manufacturing department might want the most high quality raw materials. And high quality raw materials would maximize the value added by the manufacturing department. At the same time, high quality raw materials might not be what the purchasing department might buy, because they are trying to save money. So, they might look for a cheaper option and buy something cheap. And the manufacturing department might be left with substandard inputs with which manufacturer suffers. So, here is a simple situation, where two departments have clashing objectives, which do not lead up to maximizing of the, the, the firm's profits. Is that clear? Likewise, you have the board of directors who say this, this year the firm must maximize profits, we, we should show a result of 8 percent profit, 9 percent profit, whatever after tax. But then the executives of the firm, the chief executive downwards, the, the CEO, the vice presidents and so on and so forth, might themselves have different objectives. The CEO might like to give himself a yacht at company expense. Why not? He is serving the company, he wants to maximize his perks. Or the vice president might try to acquire shares from the company saying, I need equity participation in order to be efficient. In other words, the executives or the employees of the firm, they have objectives which may not necessarily be the objectives of the directors of the firm. Have you heard of a name for this situation, where you employ somebody as your agent or as your representative to do what you want to be done, and that person acquires or has a different maximizing objective and acts in a very different way from what you want him to act. There is a, there is a name for this in economics, this problem, absolutely, say it again, perfect. It is a principal agency problem. So, you have the principal who is the shareholder appoints an agent who is a CEO. The two might have entirely different and sometimes contradictory objectives, which might result in a stalemate. This principal agency problem is also known, if you may recall, as a moral hazard problem. 
So, the question is not only that the agent might not act in the way in which you want him to act in order to maximize the firm's objectives, but you might also end up having costs of monitoring that agent, which might make the firm inefficient. You might have to have ad adopt a whole lot of monitoring procedure in which you monitor the CEO and the vice president and so forth, and that might add to the cost of the firm that might actually push you into lower profits. So, here is a situation where the firm is looked upon as an organization. The organization is looked upon as, a, a, as consisting of several component entities, each of which has its own objectives, each of its own, each of which has its own inner directives. As a result of which, the decision making in the company leadership is a problem of trying to satisfy a number of department heads who do not agree with each other. It is a very standard thing for instance, if you look into companies like say TVS or something like that, you will have a discussion in which the board would say well the target for production should be this x, y, z. Immediately the marketing department would say oh is that right then my marketing target should be so much, so much, so much. And then they say the manufacturing department should produce so much in order to meet our marketing targets. The manufacturing department say, oh of course not, who is going to get you the raw materials? I mean the purchasing department has to bring us this, this, this kind of inputs, then we can manufacture this. At which the finance department would say, who is going to give you the money to purchase all these things? You, it needs money. You want to market this, who is giving you promotional expenditure? So, the finance department brings its own caveat and draws a lot of lines on what people can do, what people can't do in order to optimize financial efficiency. So, this kind of thing happens all the time in organizations, I mean like TVS or like uh, Tata's and so on and so forth. But they have over a period of time found ways in which to handle it and this is what Simon says. Simon says under such situations, the firm is not a maximizer of any objective. The firm does what Simon calls satisfying behavior, right? Satisfying behavior in the sense that you try to make a compromise of all these departmental objectives and targets and so forth, try to achieve a via media, achieve a compromise among them in such a manner that the firm keeps moving. In this particular case, what is happening is rational decision making on the firm, whether it is with respect to profit maximization objective or any other objective is limited by the circumstances existing in the firm. Am I not right? So, this rationality according to Simon is what he calls bounded rationality. It has boundaries given by the circumstances and therefore, this rationality is bounded rationality. So, he says most organizations have structures which make possible only bounded rationality and not complete rationality. When you have when you have bounded rationality, then your behavior is not maximizing behavior, it is a satisfying behavior. You are constantly trying to achieve compromise between a number of conflicting departments and sections within the company which are trying to make their own voices heard. So, other economists like Syert and March who wrote after Simon emphasized the fact that satisfying behavior rather than objectives, objective maximizing behavior is what should be considered as the behavioral norm of firms. So, this approach came to be called in contrast with the approach of profit maximizers and so forth, it came to be called the behavioral approach. Now, Simon goes one step further. In the 1940s, Simon is talking about bounded rationality as a kind of an structural or exogenous constraint to the decision maker. By 1960s, Simon the psychologist has got to thinking so much further about this issue that he writes that bounded rationality is not an objective condition as he was originally thinking. 
what I mean is it is not just an objective condition in terms of finance department wants this, this one wants this, some externally existing objective condition. No, it is not just that. There are so many constraints within the human mind, which constrain, which, which influence you to think in particular directions, which are non-rational, but which are part of your decision making process. For example, if you have got a person who is heading the finance department and you are the CEO, the human resources head might have in talk to you about this finance head to you as a CEO giving you a bad impression about his capabilities. So, you might whenever you have a conversation with the head of the finance department you will be saying ah oh, this guy. Huh? He is bad guy, he is not good for the company. So, you see there is a bias and that bias in turn influences your decision making about how you accept the recommendations of the finance department head. This is one way in which boundaries to rationality can be internal and not external. They can be endogenous in the decision maker rather than exogenous. They can be subjective rather than existing in the objective conditions. So, from 1940s to 1960s, Simon goes on to argue that bounded rationality is a state of mind. It is not just objectively existing conditions. Now, the moment you bring in bounded rationality as a state of mind, that is a huge step away. Because earlier on you said, okay, individually you are rational, but there are boundaries existing in the circumstances which limit your being rational. So, you have to make a compromise and do satisfying kind of arrangement. Now, what Simon says is no, 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 no. I mean the boundaries are in your mindset. You have all kinds of things in your mind which induce biases, which induce thought processes which are not rational. So, by 1960s Simon accepts the decision maker himself as a non-rational individual whose rationality is bounded by a number of internal subjective factors. Partly might be information or lack of information, partly it might be lack of ability or knowledge to process information and you might have a deficiency in processing information which might be part of the boundary or you might simply out of your bias overlook some information and bring in some other information in your choice set simply because you are mentally biased like that. In short, the moment rationality becomes, the boundaries to rationality become internal, the moment the boundaries to rationality become subjective, the moment boundaries to rationality become endogenous to the decision maker rather than exogenous, then the whole scenario changes. The scenario becomes far more complicated than simply limitations imposed by organizations. Right? You might be earlier on, you might be rational, but the organization imposes limitations on what you can do. But now, you are limited as a person. You are limited as a decision maker who is working in a limited organizational framework. So, that is enormously dynamic, where the satisficer himself has great subjectivity in his decision making. So, this is the extent to which critique of conventional rationality has gone. So, this becomes a major lesson for people like Nelson and Winter who are propounders of new evolutionism or new Schumpeterianism. The basic foundations with which Nelson and Winter start are Schumpeterian. In other words, they look upon the firm's decision making in regard to its knowledge and knowledge base as being crucial in the whole process of evolution, which takes pretty much off from Schumpeter's entrepreneur. If you look at the five things which the entrepreneur tried to do in Schumpeterian framework, they were just basically his knowledge was expanding and deepening all the time and he was trying to innovate based on that, whether it is starting a new product or whether it is starting a new process or whether it is starting a new organizational form, whether it is starting a new market or whether it is starting new supply sources, whatever. 
he was constantly expanding and deepening his knowledge base. Am I right? And in the process, he was creating new ways of thinking, new combinations, as Schumpeter put it. So, once again, it is the dynamic of the mind of the entrepreneur which lay at the heart of the dynamic of the organization, which lay at the heart of the dynamic of the industry, and therefore lay at the heart of the dynamic of the economy as a whole. Now, Nelson and Winter accept this knowledge base as a start, but they say you do not have to think of an entrepreneur, you can think of a corporation where there is no single entrepreneur, where there is a corporate decision making. So, the first thing that Nelson and Winter argue is that all firms are organizations. And what is important in this is that the decision making basis in organization is not like decision making basis in the theory of the firm. In the theory of the firm, there is an entrepreneur who decides on the strategies involved in minimizing cost and therefore, maximizing profit. He equates marginal cost with marginal revenue at the limit and then says this is how much I shall produce. Now, you do not have such a decision making process according to Nelson and Mentor in corporations. They accept what Simon, Syert and Mart, March have already said. They said firms have a complex organizational structure and therefore, firms have a an organizational way of thinking, not any individual leading and so forth. There is an organizational way of thinking. The firm as a whole as an organization is to be thought of as a decision making entity consisting of many sub module decision makers. Right? So, that being the case, then each of these entities will be deciding what the organization as a whole will be doing. And, he, and Nelson and Winter says, what they do, what they decide, how they decide is a function of how the organization is habituated to functioning. How each department is functioning in the organization depends upon how that department is used to functioning. How each section in the department is used to functioning is a function of how that section is used to functioning. In other words, the whole of the behavior of organization is reduced by Nelson and Winter into what they call routines. The whole organization is nothing but a whole set of routines. They are not making any decisions all the time. They are actually doing things as a routine all the time. What does a fitter do in a shop floor? He does what fitters have done before him all the time. He does the same thing. What does a welder do on a shop floor? Shop floor? He does what welders have already done. He welds things together. What does a stores manager do in the company? He maintains a record of uh, inventory of stock and so forth. And as, as and now things changing, he has a routine way of entering and making records. In other words, Everyone in the organization is following routines. And every division, every department, every part of the organization is doing its routines. So, they are not all the time as in a neoclassical case sitting and deciding what they should do. No, they are involved in routines. They are going on doing what they have been doing, they set routines. And what is most, most important? It is the set of routines that is responsible for the production activity in the company. It is the set of routines which actually ends up deciding how much is produced by the firm, what processes, what processes are used by the firm to produce this, what technologies are involved, what raw materials and inputs are involved. In other words, there are routines relating to all these things which eventually decide what the firm does as a production set. So, the product set of the company or the production set of the company, which is basically the composition of goods and services which the company generates as its output is nothing but a function of all these routines. And these routines 
are nothing but repositories of knowledge. Each routine is one way of doing things, no? And that way of doing things is how the firm knows how to do it. So, the production set is not a set of goods and services, production set is actually a knowledge bundle, which is manifesting in the routines in which the firm is constantly involved. So, organizations are nothing but collators of routines and the knowledge of the firm about its technology, about what it is doing and so on and so forth is nothing but what is already inherent in the routines. Now, in this framework, the question arises, what are skills? Because everything is a routine, what is a skill? How do you distinguish between a skilled person and an unskilled person if they are all doing the routines? And here, the, a very interesting argument is made by Nelson and Winter. He says, skill is a way human beings have of doing complex things in seemingly a manner even unknown to themselves. In other words, a skilled worker is the machine just takes the machine into his hands and starts doing it. He does not say, ah, I am going to do this and then I am going to do this. No, it just happens like an automatic flow. So, most skill is an activity or is a capacity to act, which is not articulated, which is not a subject of decision making. It just happens. So, all routines in the, in the organization have the other face in the form of skills in the members of the organization. The skills are the subjective interface and the routines are the objective interface in the working of the organization. Is that clear, Vishnu? So, according to Nelson and Winter, the whole business of evolution relates to what happens to this knowledge, which is inherent in the routines and in the skills. So, how does a firm acquire more knowledge, more skill? In the first place, according to Nelson and Winter, the firm is constantly involved in search, not so much research, but search. Like an entrepreneur in a Schumpeterian context, the, the performer of each routine in each department, they are trying to do things differently. Right? The firm as a whole, it knows its context in the industry. For instance, the firm as a whole knows that there are other firms in that industry, which are making more profit or who have a higher market share. So, the top level decision making routines are such that they will look at this and then they will pass it on down the line saying, we are not, we are lagging behind, we have to do something to improve our market share or improve our profits and so forth. So, that is the that is the key which goes to all the departments and their routine saying, oh, so they all have to do things better. So, immediately they all start searching for how to do things better. So, they are try to acquire new pieces of knowledge, they try to acquire new ways of doing things. In short, all the components of the organization involved with different routines are all doing what the Schumpeterian entrepreneurs are doing for the firm. Only thing is they are doing it within their routines, because the challenge in the environment pushes them in that direction. Other firms are making more profit or other firms are gaining a market share, we must do. So, this is the stochastic or random factor in the market, which is changing market shares or changing profit profiles, which is the information which is information which a company as an entire organization has, which is translating this stochastic information into transformation of routines, search for routines. Is that Irene? Is that understood? So, which in turn would mean that individual performers are looking at their skills. How can I do this better? Can I organize this better? In other words, they are looking at relearning, reacquiring. In short, 
all routines and all skills in the organization are all the time under the pressure of search. Because the pressure of search is all the time there, because the organization is all the time subject to stochastic external influences. So, this is the evolutionary theory of Nelson and Winter. And what happens in this process? Growth of knowledge, growth of technology or change in technology are all changes in skills and knowledge, which are all all the time responding to stochastic external influences. And so, it is part of the routine of the organization to be involved in search. You do not, you know, once, once the, the organization accepts as a matter of its own existence that there are stochastic factors, then another routine is to be searching all the time. You anticipate stochastic influences on the company and saying, oh, the other fellow might get mar better market share. So, let me uh, try and uh, sell my product better is what our marketing department already do. It might be searching for better routines. The manufacturing department may be selling, searching for better routines to turn out better products than the possible rivals. In short, the activity of search is continuously involved in, so that search itself becomes a routine. Now, that search is a dynamic for the firm, because the continuous search is the one with which the company is trying to continually do what the Schumpeterian entrepreneur did in the Schumpeterian system. The company is trying to, the, the organization is continuously trying to in different branches improve the routines, improve the skills and constantly move, move, move in anticipation of stochastic shocks. Now, that being the case, the economy is evolving. So, there might be stochastic factors that provide a shock, but there might be no stochastic factors which might provide a shock if the firm can simply live in continuous anticipation of stochastic factors. So, this is the theory of new Schumpeterianism or new evolutionism of Nelson and Winter in economics. How effective is this evolutionary theory is a matter of time to show, because this evolutionism is, evolutionism, is, evolutionism is about 15 to 16 years old in terms of empirical studies. A lot of empirical studies are going on, especially in trying to understand and comprehend nonlinear dynamics, because it is a very nonlinear situation. And compared to the time of say Schumpeter, lot more of mathematical tools are available to you today to study nonlinear dynamics. So, uh, the tools are available, the database is available, because these days corporations and organizations generate enormous data. The huge database is available about the state of the economy and its performance. So, there is a huge database available, there is a huge uh, knowledge base available. And enormous development in tools of analysis has occurred. So, it is possible that in times to come, there are different sub modules developed in the study of evolution of organizations. So much for new evolutionism. So, let us look back and evaluate its role in relation to a couple of other aspects of unorthodox economics. One type of unorthodox economics, which we explored yesterday was institutional economics. In institutional economics, we were trying to evaluate not just the role of institutions in the economic activity of economic agents, but also how institutions themselves can rise and fall depending, depending upon the way how transaction costs are determined by them. If institutions are enabled, if they enable you to minimize transaction costs, then it is quite possible that the institutions might be survivors. In which case, you can think of these institutions and the rise and fall of institutions, the history of institutions itself as some kind of a selection process. If that is the case, then the history of organizations functioning within such institutional constraints is possible to, to be thought of as 
another evolutionary process. So, it seems that there is a substantial scope for the integration of institutional economics with evolutionary economics. Likewise, the integration of what is called industrial organization. Now, a lot of studies of this type of Simon and Syert and Marx, these are all industrial organization type studies. A lot of that can be well incorporated into evolutionary economics. So, it is possible that in the times to come, the frontiers of economics might grow very dynamically to define a very rapidly changing discipline concerned with rapidly changing economic environments and rapidly changing economic conduct among organizations. But that is for the future to show. At this point in time, we can say that the start is there in evolutionary economics. The basis is there in both institutional economics and industrial organizations to provide more material, to provide more detail in order to increase knowledge of the economy. In all this that we have studied yesterday and today, there is one central issue which becomes very crucial, which shall be the determinant of what we shall be doing in the next lectures. We were talking about what orthodox theory, theory does, we were talking about what Walrasian system does and how Schumpeter changed this picture. Here, there is a very interesting contrast, a line which Schumpeter is drawing with reference to theory. Schumpeter says, Walrasian system is a stationary state, dynamics can be brought into it by looking at entrepreneurial behavior. In short, what Schumpeter is saying is, economic theory gives you some inputs about understanding how the economy is working. Experience about the economy gives you another set of inputs. In short, the theory does not tell you what the entrepreneur does. It is Schumpeter's experience, his empirical learning which did that. But Schumpeter put the two together and suddenly brought up a new theory, which is the Schumpeterian theory of economic growth. Now, from this what we learn is that there are two sides to the process of growth of knowledge in any discipline, including economics. It seems to me that there is a side where the knowledge looks inward as it were research. You polish the tools of analysis more and more and more, refine them and enable you to reach more rarefied conclusions more analytically rigorous conclusions, that is one direction. The other is, there is a constant reference to human experience, there is a constant reference to what is known as the empirical, which acts as a sounding board for all that a rigorous theory is producing. To me, it seems to me that knowledge is born at that interface, where the refinement of tools of knowledge meets empirical experience. In other words, the evolution of a science itself is a function of some kind of a selection principle which seems to operate with respect to theories, tools and paradigms when they are referred to the test of experience. So, we can think in terms of possibilities of directions of ev evolution of knowledge. So, in my summing up lectures on Tuesday, I shall look at this process and look at the whole history of what we have studied in this particular semester in the history of economic thought and use that inference or use the inferences from all that to make an argument about A is there a selection process going on in the development of knowledge? B, what kind of process is this? And C, is there something scientific about the selection process? Is it something totally stochastic? It is random. We shall look at all these things. In short, we shall ask what constitutes the growth of knowledge, not just in economics, but as a backdrop in science in general. Meanwhile, good evening.